Yesterday and today, uh, the board decisions, uh, we have uh, done it in a very class classroom way, so there were no chantings and anything. So day after tomorrow, we will do the recitation of Heart Sutra and also do the Bodhisattva Swa taking. And uh, after that, we will do the Majushri's uh, permission initiation. Uh, actually, there are different uh, types of the Majushri permission uh, empowerment. So we will do the the one from the Majushri's priest, Gangloma. So some of you must be reciting uh, this praise to Manjushri every day. So if even if you are not doing that, and I think it will be great if you can memorize this short uh, prayer, a uh, praise to Manjushri. And uh, my the my uh, big shoes vows uh, spiritual master Ling uh, used to. Uh, recite the praise from Manjushri called uh, Ganloma, and uh, end of the praise I uh, used to uh, do the recitation of, and also do the uh, Manjushri's mantra. Uh, since this is the praise for the Manjushri, of course, uh, that it will be a great uh, source of blessing. And uh, this is also a very summarized, so you don't need a very extensive uh, arrangements for that and even for me also this is a very uh, convenient uh, way to uh, bestow the uh, permission so after this text uh, transmission is over we will do the uh, Manjushri's praise and uh, followed by the permission and also uh, other uh, related some mantras and uh, the afternoon of uh, day after tomorrow's session we will uh, uh, try to meet uh, so different groups and uh, do a Q&A session and interaction with different groups here. So this fourth chapter on the conscientiousness and the most important part is about the afflicted emotions and the negativities of uh, those emotions and uh, these are very effective in one's own uh, practice if we can implement and put it into one's own practice and this is already completed so uh, so if you have some illness for your uh, body, so generally you have to be very cautious about uh, what you eat and your uh, behavior. And also if you have some uh, sore or something on your body, so then you will be very vigilant. So uh, generally, so therefore, for someone who is taking the Bodhisattva vows, so he or she has to be very vigil uh, against any of the shortcomings. So therefore, when one has the conscientiousness practice, uh, one will be able to recognize what are the uh, negativities that arise and also uh, whatever the behavior is pertaining to our body, spe body speech and mind and uh, these kind of activities are against my bodhisattva vows so that one will be very mindful of those activities so that one can restrain uh, from indulging in these activities and what are the things to be abandoned and what are the things to be practiced so we can draw a very clear line distinction between what is right and wrong 
And uh, so therefore, the mindfulness also become important. And when one has a very good uh, mindful, uh, so it helps, uh, it also give rise to uh, what we call the vigilant or the guarding alertness. So if we have a good vigilant uh, mind, then it will help uh, to guard one's mind against whether it is going towards the negativities or the positive actions. So generally, uh, the main uh, cause for arising the vigilant is the mindfulness. And but the primary, uh, the cause for uh, generating a very clear vigilant is being uh, guarding and being very conscious of one's own body, speech, and mind actions every day. And uh, another, the main cause is from day to day and from time to time, whether it's one's behavior or whether it's one's mental state. So we have to always be very conscious of and bring uh, always. Uh, be very vigilant against one's own activities, whether it's physical or mental. So even for the beginners, uh, we uh, need to be very mindful for all our uh, activities. And uh, the energy or the level or the quality of the mindfulness need to be improved from uh, time to time. But here, the mindfulness is actually spoken around uh, at the time of ethical discipline. But later, as the mindfulness improves and uh, elevated to another level, it will uh, generate one of the three trainings, what we call the concentration. So whether and it leads to the generation of the calm abiding uh, meditation, the shamatha meditation. So whether the meditation calm abidance is focused to our inner self, or towards one's own mind, or anything. So whatever the focus of this meditation, it is it is very important that that focus is being uh, constantly alerted or constantly being kept at one point with the help of uh, mindfulness. And uh, from the Tantra, of course, the mindfulness also plays a very important role when the subtle, the very subtle uh, form of the mind uh, arises. So actually, uh, the practice of the mindfulness, the meditating on the mindfulness actually started from the basic level, uh, uh, from the time when we, uh, uh, when we become very conscious about uh, our ethical discipline and so on. And uh, as Lama Tsangkhapa has said that, the calm abidance meditation or the shamatha meditation has to be such that once, once it is kept, once, is, once it is focused on is object, it has to be very strong and non unwavering like the Mount Meru. But once it applies to its different objects, then it has the ability to engage in all the positive objects and the focus. And uh, it has the capacity potential to uh, investigate uh, one very uh, focus point. So therefore, it is very important that the mindfulness also play a very important in terms of the calm abiding meditation. And the shamatha meditation is again uh, common both to Buddhists and non-Buddhists. And this is not a unique practice pertaining to Buddhists. Again, uh, the shamatha meditation, which is accompanied by the special insight, which is the vipassana meditation, so uh, any kind of uh, meditative uh, uh, practice which is accompanied by special insight will be much more powerful. So here the, the mindfulness and the consensus is actually being taught at the time of the ethical, t ethical discipline chapter. And even in the Tantra, so the mindfulness becomes very important in one's daily practice. So next is the fifth chapter, Garden Alertness, the first uh, verse. Those who wish to guard their practice should very attentively guard their minds. And uh, His Holiness comments that here uh, the Bodhisattvas' uh, practices are very important. The, 
the precepts that are coming from Vinaya commitments, the precepts pertaining to Vinaya uh, commitments are mainly the physical and the verbal. So uh, ver various the precepts or the advice coming from the Bodhisattva's practice is mainly towards guarding one's own mental state from uh, wandering to different issues. And the third line reads, for those who do not guard their minds will be unable to guard their practice. So generally, the causes uh, which give rise to so negative actions are the uncontrolled mind or the disturbed mind. And the positive actions also uh, are rooted in the mind. So for example, so we turn to the ninth verse. So the, each verse uh, speaks about the generosity, then ethical discipline, and so on. And uh, most importantly, by uh, giving, uh, we will be able to uh, eliminate the poverty of the, the people. But merely by giving, we won't be able to accomplish the perfection of generosity. So how to attain the perfection of the generosity is by uh, improving once uh, the once the mind, which is actually the mind of giving, to another level. And when it reaches the ultimate state, then one attains the perfection of generosity. And the 11th verse reads that now here, now here has the killing of fish and other creatures been eradicated. For the attainment of the thought to first act is explained as the perfection of moral discipline. And the 12 verse is actually very beautiful. Unruly beings are as space. His Holiness comments that uh, externally it is impossible to eliminate all the external uh, obscurations or all the external factors that disturb one's peace of mind. And the second line, third line reads that, but if I overcome the thoughts of anger alone, this will be equivalent to increasing all force. And His Holiness comments that. Uh, the mind, which is the source of all the disturbing emotions within us, and uh, also a very calm mind, having understood the main reason and the background. So if we are able to maintain such a, disturb, such a calm mind, then we will be able to destroy all the afflicted emotions. And the next verse, the verse number 13, wherever I possibly find enough leather, and so on, reads in the same. And also, when we speak about the positive actions, actually, uh, there are three times pertaining to body, speech, and mind. But the accumulations of the positives uh, pertaining to the mental, the mind, is the most important and most powerful. And uh, when we speak about finding the nature of the mind, and, uh, and the mind here is not just about uh, focusing to one's uh, focus. Also, when we practice the generation stage, of course, we need that uh, we need to have a vision of the deity in terms of the understanding of emptiness. So if you do not have the understanding of a clear emptiness, then merely the meditating on the deity will uh, bring us to the law realms. So this is uh, very clearly uh, debated in one of the texts. So uh, the generation stage uh, meditation at the very moment. So actually there are few uh, classifications, whether they are conventionally expect or the uh, or the ultimate emptiness aspect. So, general, what it what it means is that uh, it has to be backed uh, by a clear understanding of uh, emptiness. And uh, also, when it speaks about eliminating all the conventional elaborations, it means that have with the power of a very strong emptiness, understanding of emptiness, one should be able to uh, clear all the conventional 
uh, uh, conventional elaboration. So this is the uh, meaning of Om Sabah Shuddha Sawadham, Sabah Shuddha Hang, which uh, presents the selflessness pertaining to the person and the phenomena both together. And also the Om Shu Nadayana also uh, presents in the same way. So therefore, without the understanding of emptiness, merely by re recitation of the mantras may not lead to very effective uh, result. Of course, even though if you have Shamada meditation, a very calm abundance meditation, uh, without the support of the uh, wisdom realizing emptiness, it won't be uh, possible to use it against as antidote against the ignorance which give rise to, which uh, bring us to the cyclic existence. So having uh, achieved the calm abiding meditation, then uh, later during the special inside part, we have to uh, generate the emptiness, a focus on other external phenomena. Then later during the generation stage, so when we meditate on the emptiness, the focus is not the contaminated objects. So the, the emptiness itself uh, pertaining to the generation stage from the Tantra is generally referred to as the pure or the uncontaminated emptiness. So uh, some of the Tibetan masters also draw uh, such a distinction between uh, the object of the emptiness. So even though the emptiness from the nature of itself as an absence of the object of negation may not be different, but the object or the ob basis of designation is different. So f at the first uh, level, of course, it is the uncontaminated phenomena, such as uh, the external objects. But uh, when it comes to the generation stage and so on, so the object of the meditation or the emptiness, the basis of designation also is uncontaminated. And uh, that very uh, emptiness uh, later becomes uh, uh, one of the four enlightened kayas, uh, which is uh, referred to as the, the nature of the Buddha's uh, enlightened body. And with this uh, capacity uh, with, and with this practice, one has the potential to uh, accomplish both the accumulations pertaining to merit and wisdom. So therefore, uh, when we speak about the meditating on emptiness, it is impossible to do the meditation by the sensory, uh, by our senses. So therefore, it has to be our mind or the conceptual mind that has to do the meditating on emptiness. So the verse number 17, so as we uh, discussed before, that all the negativities and the positive actions are uh, dependent upon the mind. So even those who wish to find happiness and overcome misery will want uh, with no aim for meaning. If they do not comprehend the secret of Dharma, the Brahman signification of Dharma. So even though one may engage in uh, the practice of generosity and uh, the other uh, perfections, but uh, without the understanding of emptiness, there will be uh, no possibility to eliminate the root of all the sufferings, which is the ignorance. So the verse number 18 reads that, this being so, the reason being so, I shall hold and guard my mind well. Without the discipline of guarding the mind, what use are many other disciplines? So generally in our daily basis, so whether it's a, uh, while we are sleeping or uh, while we are awake, even during when we talk with some other people, so we always have to guard our mind what we are going to talk or whether we are going to uh, hurt any people with abusive languages and so on. So the vigilant has to be always there. 
even uh, when we go from one place to another, even uh, during the road, if there's any uh, insects on the road or not. So if I just cross over that, maybe I will step on those small creatures. So maybe you can move them to a safer place and so on. So in this term of practice, the Jain uh, practitioners are great. A great example. So therefore, they wear a mask, and also they have a broom on their hand. And so whenever they go, they always clear the road in front of them, so that uh, those animals are not hurted. So this is wonderful. So therefore, the vigilant is very important here, guarding one's alertness. So verse number 23, O you who wish to guard your minds, I beseech you with folded hands, always exert yourself to guard mindfulness and alertness. And this is again speaking about the practice of mindfulness, and one has to be always being conscious of oneself as being a big shoe or something so that being a big shoe, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not supposed to do that and uh, those actions. So the mindfulness becomes very important. So 29 verse. Therefore, I shall never let mindfulness depart from the doorway of my mind. So therefore, uh, I will never let the mindfulness to degenerate uh, or to, to lower its state. Even if it goes, I shall recall the mystery of the lower realms and firmly re-establish it here. So this is the third and fourth line uh, from the verse number 29. So even our mind, the, uh, the mindfulness uh, decrease, then uh, we have to immediately think about that if one strays away from one's mindfulness, then one may result in all those sufferings. So. Uh, what are the external uh, factors for generating a good mindfulness is due with the help of one of our uh, spiritual master which uh, teaches us uh, the path. So therefore, the spiritual master becomes very important. For example, what kind of the education, the quality of education uh, of a school uh, uh, depends upon the quality of the teacher we have and uh, if the teachers are qualified or not and most important, whether the teachers are kind-hearted and they uh, have uh, they care for the students and the teachers, uh, if they are responsible, someone with a responsibility. So therefore, this will uh, make a lot of difference. So therefore, uh, merely a good educated teacher will not be uh, sufficient. So even though the teacher may be very well versed in his uh, current topic, but if you do not have some care or uh, the willingness to teach uh, to the students, even though he may be a great scholar, but uh, his teaching may not be that effective. And uh, the teachers, uh, the students, if they do not have a great uh, respect and uh, a feeling of a closeness to one's uh, teachers, then it won't be also possible to improve the general quality of education. And if the teacher, in turn, uh, is also very cared towards the students, then the students will respond in the same way. So therefore, here also, the spiritual master becomes important to rely on a spiritual master, uh, which is the external factor to develop a right mindfulness becomes very important. There's verse number, verse number 30. Through staying in the company of spiritual masters, his Holiness comments that the spiritual master uh, is someone who instruct us, who give us instruction about the teachings of the Buddha uh, pertaining to the three baskets of trainings. Three baskets. And uh, I used to say that, I think I can say that because I'm Dalai Lama who sits on a high throne. 
And uh, if I tell the mistakes and the faults of a spiritual master by someone who is himself a spiritual master, then I think there is no great deal. I can. I think it's appropriate. And uh, we have we have a religious congregation before, and I was invited also. And there are a few uh, other uh, masters. And uh, just beside me, there was a great Hindu master. And he was sitting on a great, uh, he was sitting on a very well ordained uh, throne. So even though it was very uh, uh, big, so but he felt that it was still low. And so they put extra brick under the chair to make it even higher. And the spiritual master was sitting on the throne like a statue, even not uh, laughing. <laughs> Too much formalities. So, since I have a mischievous thought, and I wanted to crack some playful jokes all the time, so I thought, uh, if I take, <laughs> if the brick under the table falls down, <laughs> I thought it will be very nice. So if one of the bricks fall down, then the throne will also move so that the master will also act like human. So th this thought came to my mind. Otherwise, the, the Hindu master was just acting like a statue. And in Tibet, we have a saying that the, the preciousness of a master uh, is being judged by the number of the horse. If someone who just uh, comes with only some uh, rag clothes, then he is not considered a great master. So this is really a great mistake. And we have the examples like Zabedu Rumbiche, who is the uh, great uh, master of the Shandideva's this text, and also a great learned one. And uh, once he was in his own monastery, and uh, out of some disturbance, he went out. Of course, he used to stay in the mountain as retreat. And uh, he went to the mountains for retreat, and uh, he has nothing much to carry, uh, just carry his the three a set of robes on his shoulder and went outside. And uh, on the way, he uh, rested for one night in one of the house. And the landlord uh, saw the monk and thought that this is a very common monk because uh, he was wearing very uh, poor and uh, rag monk's clothes. And they just thought that this is just someone who goes on doing some pujas. And uh, the landlady also uh, gave him, uh, asked him, uh, met him do some household chores, like cleaning the uh, utensils and so on. And after a few days, a few days passed in this way, and uh, of course the Zabedu Rinpoche has so many uh, disciples for all the Satya, Kajyu, Nema, and so on. So some of his students happened to, uh, happened to pass this way in order to see him, and they thought that he might have taken this route. Uh, they guess it, and uh, in order to investigate investigate it, so then they happened to come to this uh, landlady, this house, and uh, they asked the landlady about, have you have has she seen my guru, my teacher? Then the landlady replied that, I do not know about any such great masters. I just saw a very common and simple monk with only a few robes. So this is what the landlady re replied. And he explained. Then she described the description about the face and the clothes he wear. Uh, sorry, the students described. Then the landlady came to realize that, of course, what she thought was a great master. So at that time, and uh, Zabedu Rinpoche also came uh, in front of them with uh, something in hand by cleaning. And also he was cleaning the landlady's uh, utensil where she used to pee. <laughs> so, 
so that uh, so when she realized her mistake she was so shy and she frightened and she went away she ran away so we have such stories in Tibet this is due to uh, the less knowledge in our societies all over the world. So therefore, uh, we do not know what is the real nature of real qualities of a master. And I think that these are really a very uh, poor, uh, poor symbols. I think about uh, 20 years back, uh, I met someone a Chinese uh, devotee coming from uh, coming to see me, and he told me that now this China Chinese people are more interested in the teaching. There happens to be uh, ma many uh, masters coming from Tibet to China who claim themselves as Dharma Raja, the king of uh, the teacher, and uh, also uh, late they give teachings. And later, when they have more disciples and the time pass. So even though who claim to be the Dhammaraja, they what they really need is money, and what they really need is women. So this also happened, and many peoples are uh, deceived, deceived by such uh, such uh, peoples. Then he asked me whether I can do something for that. Then I told them that I am staying in India and there is nothing that much that I can do. So, but yours, you can make a difference. So there are a lot of the qualifications that are presented in the different texts. For example, from Vinaya context, there is a certain uh, qualities pertaining to what is called the resident master. Then also we can find the characteristic of the masters coming from the sutra and so on. So if someone claimed to be the king of the Dhamma teachers and came to you, then you must first investigate and examine whether he or she has those qualities or not. And of, uh, I think it's something like to keep a spy against your master. So after thorough investigations and examinations, then if you found, and first at the initial stage, you can consider the master, that monk, as a, your friend and ask him uh, about the Dharma teachings and so on. But then eventually if you find a trust in him and that he possess all those qualities, then later you can consider him as your uh, teacher. And, uh, even in Dharamsala, uh, there are many, uh, I think about 20 or 30 years, uh, we have a conference where uh, uh, many participants from European countries came and someone say that uh, this, the one who claimed to be the masters, uh, the masters, uh, make a lot of mischievous things in the European countries, then I told them that there is nothing else you can do. So uh, you have to show those things, present those things to the newspapers and the media so that they won't be actually afraid of the Buddha's teachings or the rules and the commitments, but they may have a face to hide. So therefore, if you uh, show them to the newspapers, if you write about them in the newspapers, then maybe they will be a bit more ashamed. So to be a real a genuine uh, spiritual master in the ornaments of the sutra, there are the ten qualities counted pertaining to the three trainings that the teacher has to be a very calm, uh, pacify, and uh, total pacify. So these three actually speaks about, the first three speaks about the three trainings pertaining to, three trainings. Uh, the first one, the ethical discipline, uh, where one is very behaviorally, uh, very calm. Then second, the concentration. And the third one, when it say uh, totally pacify, it is due to the wisdom the training of the uh, wisdom that one's, uh, one's coarse afflicted emotions are controlled. The fourth one is to have a superior knowledge, is that the master needs to have a superior uh, knowledge compared to the students. 
In Tibet, uh, one of, uh, we have a story that a uh, master gave a teaching, and uh, the master taught about that uh, going for refuge to the three jewels and spoke about the Buddha. And one of the disciples asks, So you say that the Buddha is very precious, then where is the Buddha? Then the, uh, the master uh, do not understand about the four enlightened experts or anything. So he simply said that, or he just finger towards the sky and then he is in the deep sky in a very crystal palace and blazing there. So therefore, the master has to be someone who is very fluent with what he teach. And the fourth quality is about uh, about to have higher knowledge compared to the students. And the fifth one is that the master has to be also very hardworking, otherwise the master will be tired before the students. And the sixth quality is someone with a great resourceful, uh, even though one may have great realizations, but uh, pertaining to the general text and the teachings, one need to be very well versed about all the texture and the commentaries. And the eighth one is that having understood of the emptiness. So maybe here, uh, the first one, we can uh, give it to the understanding of the severalness pertaining to the lower schools or pertaining to selflessness of the person. But the later one is the phenomena, selflessness of phenomena. So understanding the suchness, mm. so this is counted as one of the qualities. And one has to be very eco one has to be very uh, well uh, speech. And one who is free of any uh, tiresome. So these are the qualities coming from the ornaments of sutra. So uh, if someone has all the ten qualities, of course, it is the best. But otherwise, one need to have at least a few of uh, those qualities. And if someone has these qualities, then we can regard uh, them as uh, the great master who speak uh, Mayana teachings, who give Mayana teachings. So other than that, if someone with a great uh, lead led by a num m number of horses doesn't even make him a great a teacher. And also Lama Tsongkhaba uh, has uh, taught in the Lam Rim Chemo uh, with a special outline about the uh, definitions, the qualities pertaining to a spiritual master, then also the qualities of uh, uh, the disciples and how one has to rely on a spiritual master and so on. So be it here in Japan, in Taiwan, or in any other parts of the world. So whenever you see uh, a master coming from Tibet, you should not just go and receive the teaching. You must first investigate and do some checking about whether that's a real master or not. And also, when we speak about the disciples' qualifications in the 400 verses, we speak about someone with uh, attention, and unbiased. So if someone is unbiased and fall on one side, then uh, he or she has fallen under uh, the influence of the afflicted emotions. So then it may result in seeing even the good qualities as one's mistakes, or even one's mistakes as good qualities. And the second quality is about being attention, or someone with the uh, discriminated awareness is that if when the master teaches something and he or she should not be following the teachings immediately, rather he or she should uh, do some uh, checking and investigations and only after that one has to uh, practice. And also, uh, he or she should not consider that as a mere a kind of a subject to study or uh, a story, but to take it as a way of one's own practice. And the third is that one has to egg, one has to be eager to listen. So these three qualities of the disciple are taught by Arya Deva, one of the great students of Nagarjuna. <coughs> so this is the 30 verse. The third and the fourth line reads, the mindfulness will easily be generated in fortunate people who practice with respect. 
So therefore, uh, we have to understand what are the objects to be abandonment and to be practiced by studying. And uh, if we do not uh, comply with this uh, practice, then even for the immediate uh, period time, we will go under, uh, we will suffer a lot. And also for the long term, there is no need to say. And the verse number 31 reads in this way, I am ever dwelling in the presence of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattva who are always endowed with unobstructed vision. By thinking in this way, I shall mindfully develop a sense of shame, respect, and fear. This is verse number 32. And uh, the Buddhahood, which is the free of all the obscurations and uh, who has attained all the realizations and who is also at a state where both the meditative absorptions and the post meditative absorptions are the same and one. So therefore, since the Buddha is someone who possess all these qualities, there is no way that we can lie uh, towards these uh, great Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. For common people, we can uh, act, we can always act in a one way, even though we may not be that thing. So, uh, for the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, of course, the first level of Bodhisattvas are different, so they may not have all those the clairvoyant uh, practices. But the higher levels of Bodhisattvas and the Bod Buddhas, since they have attained the clairvoyance, so therefore, they will never be. We will never be able to uh, do anything against uh, as act in front of them as being a dutiful and practicing. So if we have such a kind of a, a mental uh, stability, then with that we will be able to have a vision of the Buddha. And uh, uh, even at a very young age, so we have to study this and we have to give a kind of experience or a conviction, a very strong conviction within us. Even at the time uh, of the death when the five senses are degenerated and degenerated, but the conceptual, the main consciousness can still remain very aware and very vivid. So if someone uh, has this, uh, if someone is able to do this kind of practice, then at the time of death also they can uh, remember the kindness of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and uh, they can also remember about the benefits of Bodhicitta and the Great Compassion and so on. Verse number 33, when mindfulness is set with the purpose of guarding the doorway of the mind, then alertness will come about and even that which had gone will return. And this all in his comments that with the mindfulness, if we tend to the practice that at a very continual level, then the alertness will uh, come automatically. So even if you stray away from your focus for a moment, but eventually the alertness will arrive by itself. And the next verse is about how to be mindful about uh, the things. In the verse number 34 says, when just as I'm about to act, I see that my mind is tainted. As such a time, I should remain unmovable like a piece of wood. So the following verses are similar to this. So the 56 verse, please turn to 56 verse, verse number 56. We as a part of the human society and as we discussed this morning, 
And our society itself is actually based on the materialistic uh, progress and affluence. And uh, when it comes to the materialistic gains, of course there is not a distinction between what is right and wrong, or also what is positive and negative actions. And uh, also the great uh, mind such as not uh, able to bear the pain that other people goes. Uh, so therefore this kind of the practice are not relevant in a completely materialistic uh, world. So therefore from the time when we start the first our education, we are always thinking about the materialistic progress. So our whole life has to be a very materialistic life. So anyone who has been uh, educated in such an environment will tend to have more uh, emotions uh, such as the anger and the hatred since they are brought up in this way. So verse number 56 reads, I, shall, I should not be disheartened by all the whims of the childish who are in discord with one another. His Holiness uh, comments that. So maybe we can even name this kind of the human society as a human society of uh, uh, disturbing emotions or the disturbed human society. And uh, all the humans uh, who are the people who are under the influence of the afflicted emotions, even though the person by himself or herself are not uh, negative by their own nature, but due to the power of the the afflicted emotions present within them, so they are they end up doing uh, negative things. So therefore, if we are able to uh, think in this way, then of course we can reduce our own anger and hatred towards those persons, thinking that those persons eventually did those activities under the influence of the afflicted emotions. And uh, since I'm under the influence of the afflicted emotions, even though I wish to do something positive thing by I end up doing the negative things similarly as it happened to me all the other sentient beings uh, are same in this perspective and this is also presented in the 400 verses by Arya Deva for example, a patient uh, who, due to a disturbed mind, and uh, if, when the, the patient quarrels with the uh, doctor or the medical practitioner, so the doctor will uh, automatically think that oh, this patient is quarreling or abusing me because he is under that illness and those things. So eventually the doctor will generate more compassion towards that practice. And he will also walk towards how can he cure that patients, how can he treat that patients. So similarly, this taking this as a metaphor, the Lord Buddha, and uh, someone who has understand about the situation of the afflicted emotions and their capacity, so they will fight against the emotions rather than the person who is under that influence. And this is also coming in the sixth chapter about the patients. And uh, we also have to draw a distinction between the person, the agent who uh, did the harmful actions and also his action. So the agent and the action, we have to draw a distinction between these two. So we have to uh, take prescribe antidote against the afflicted emotions as an action, but we should not feel, uh, we should not have good feeling towards the person. So therefore, with human intelligence, we can uh, practice in this way. And one of the uh, symbols that we can do that is that during uh, the time of our confession, 
So we always uh, draw a distinction between the person who commits the negativities and its actions. I used to see, we used to say that I, the name of this person, has done this and this actions, and I am now feeling remorse towards it. So here, the person as an agent is taken completely separately from the action that one has done. So similarly, uh, when someone, some other person also inflict a harm towards you, so we have to all similarly draw a distinction between the action of that other person and uh, the, per, uh, the person, so that uh, we have to take antidote against that action but feel compassion towards that person. So next is the verse number 58. By thinking again and again, then after a long time, I have won the greatest nation. And I was, I shall hold my mind. So from the next verse onwards, it's uh, presenting, it's the presentation about the ethical discipline, discipline pertaining to the collection of merits. And uh, most of the uh, pleasure, the pleasant uh, emotions that we have are pertaining, uh, related to connected to the physical uh, senses. For example, uh, clothes that we wear, house that we stay, and the foods that we eat, and so on. So these are all related to our physical body. So then the verse further reads that there is nothing that you cannot be so much attached to your body. The verse number 60 reads that holding this body as mine, why mind do you guard it so, since you and it are separate, what use can it be to you? So next is the verse number 61. Why confused mind do you not hold into a clean wooden form, just what is the point of guarding this putrid, dead filled machine? So these uh, that uh, filled machine or, or the, our uh, body is actually uh, filled with, this whole body is filled with so many substances which are very dirty by nature. And we can see the images from the operations done by the doctors and before the skin of our body, which is very smooth and which is very fair and something very attractive. Even the complexion is very, very good complexion, but later, when with the surgical blade, when the surgeon cut it, then, then the the blood and the purse comes out. And then the next, the muscles come out. Then uh, when it comes to the bones, then we can uh, come to the conclusion that our human body is nothing but a bone which is cluttered with some flesh. So then at this moment, then there is nothing that we can feel attractive about. And as we refer our human body as a dead filled machine, and eventually if you look at your the uh, organs inside, your intestines and so on, that, that the meals that we eat, First, we, uh, so with the uh, power of our teeth, so first we bite uh, the taste into different uh, pieces. So initially the food or the meal, which is in front of you in a beautiful plate with beautiful designs, but as soon as you take it into your mouth and being bited into a different taste, it loses all its beautiness. Then similarly it passes through your neck, then to your intestines, and finally to the bathroom. <laughs> So therefore, so previously the very beautiful meal in front of you on a beautiful plate later you have to go with your nose uh, close, you know, in front of those, uh, the same, uh, uh, the dirt. So this kind of the dirt film machine has not came from the sky or not from anywhere else, but from our own body. So therefore, in this way, if we meditate in this way, then our attachment towards our own physical body will decrease a lot. 
So when we have uh, attachment pertaining to the five senses to a very uh, strong way, then we have to think in this way, which will help us decrease the, our attachment towards our physical body. So what is the quality, what is the special uh, quality of this uh, human body? So the main uh, special quality that we have is the brain. And uh, with the help of the brain and the mind, we have this uh, wisdom the intelligence uh, which is uh, which is able to which has the potential to distinguish between what is right and wrong and also about what is uh, benefit for the immediate and the long term so the most important part of our human body is the brain and as we discussed yesterday that the nature of human heart is compassionate and uh, all the mammals, uh, the, even the animals, who the offsprings who depend on their mother for their birth and to take, uh, rely on the milk. So biologically, uh, we can see that they're all compassionate. But uh, those, uh, m many of those attachment, those compassions, sorry, those uh, love, between the affection between the uh, the mother and the offsprings, uh, uh, many part of it is actually the attachment. So at the very basic level, uh, even the love between a mother and the child, which is at one time a kind of a very biased one, which is focused on only one sentient beings, but later we can progress and we can enhance the nature of those mind and elevated it to a different level where it can be all encompassing compassion. So it is our the brain, uh, it is only the brain and the nature of our heart which is the compassionate. So these two are the main qualities presented in this human body. And uh, with this, uh, un with this bias to com love, to turn to bring it into the supreme compassion, so only humans can uh, do that. So even though our human body is a dreadful machine, but we, if we use it in the right way, you can uh, make it very beneficial. Seventy-one, verse number seventy-one. Please turn to verse number and to take the unfortunate event as uh, a part of your uh, activity. So this is something that we can, uh, we can do with the help of our intelligence. If an unfortunate incident happened, as it's happened to many people, many people look at that unfortunate incident from only from the negative side. So even that unfortunate incident, if you look from another direction, by that very unfortunate incident, there is also possibility that it can bring or it can create a condition for another set of positive, a positive, a positive thing. So that very unfortunate, so depending upon the person who experienced that, can uh, turn, transform that kind of the unfortunate incident as something benefiting one. And this is also due to our human intelligence. And I used to tell other people, and I also feel myself, that we are in exile. Of course, it is very sad. That is a very unfortunate incident. But from another perspective, being in exile, we have more friends now all over the world. 
and uh, uh, the Nalenda traditions and the great uh, the religious practices and the traditions that we have kept in Tibet for thousands of years, now we can bring it to the whole world. Even the modern scientists can benefit uh, from it. And I used to tell my friends that if I still live in Lhasa and uh, in the Potala Palace as a god king, so maybe I may be a very disturbed old monk. <laughs> so since coming into exile and as a refugee, there is no protocol, there is no formalities that I have to abide by, so I'm a free man. And I can meet anyone, I can have dialogue with anyone, as a same person from face to face. I feel very wonderful. So if I consider myself a Dalai Lama and secluded myself from the rest of the world, then I'm uh, at a disadvantaged side. But then if you think from the other side, so therefore the same unfortunate incident can be looked from another direction and turned to one's benefit way. So if you look in from another direction, so that unfortunate incident which earlier you have a great fear or the anger towards that uh, incident may decrease if you look from the other side. So the verse number third says that, and cease to frown and look angry, I should be a friend and counsel of the world. And his holiness comments that whenever he met anyone, he used to greet them with a smile. So sometimes I have a very uh, wrathful expression. <laughs> While there is a freedom to act, I shall always present a smiling face and cease to frown and look angry. I should be a friend and counsel of the world. So we have to go, whenever we meet someone, we have to think that we are all the part of human family and we all have these afflicted emotions. So, and within those uh, afflicted emotions, of course, uh, due to the power of our compassions that is present within all of us, and we have to practice transparency. So in this way, uh, have a friendliness feeling and a closeness feeling to everyone. And uh, whatever you speak uh, with your friends, uh, speak to them in a very clear way, without expecting or without hiding anything. So the next is verse number 72. I should desist from inconsiderate directly and noisily moving around chairs and so forth. As soon as from violently opening doors, I should always delight in humility. And this is pertaining to our daily practice. So even while closing a door, you should not close the door in a very strong way so that even the people were evoked. So if someone is sleeping in the room and if you close the door in a very strong way, then the people may think that the earthquake is coming. <laughs> as well as from violently opening doors, I should always delight in humility. Verse number 73, the stroke, the cat, and the thief, by moving silently and carefully, accomplish what they desire to do. So the main thing is we have to be very humble and uh, be very clever to, do, to gain one's own benefit. <laughs> accomplish what they desire to do, a Bodhisattva too should always believe in this way. And when you meet uh, uh, any of your friends, with respect, I should gratefully accept. And uh, the Domtamba Master, I think it was uh, the Master of Gombawa and uh, Master Domtamba, 
the masters of uh, Kadamba traditions when they were in front of the Adisha. And Gomova said that, I wish to uh, meditate, but then there is no time because Adisha make him do a lot of other chores. And then Domtamba also shared the same uh, feeling that I wanted to do some study and do some meditation, but the master uh, Adisha asked me to do some translations and other chores, and they both uh, at the same time asked against the Adisha. And then uh, Adisha says that this is true. I have the So they both uh, end up uh, agreeing with each other that we have such a great master that we have to be at his service until the very end of our life. So whenever we uh, give some guidance to other people, we should not give the guidance as you yourself do not have any kind of problems. We have to also give the share the other people's problem and to give them the advice and the guidance in the same way. It is stated in the 400 verses by Arya Deva also that with a great sense of compassion and sharing the other people's uh, suffering and the pain, then we should give guidance to them. And the verse number 74, the third and fourth line reads that, and that wisely advice and admonish me. And all times I should be the people of everyone. And one should not act as you do not have the authority to give me any kind of guidance or advice. So verse number 75 reads that I should say well said to all those who speak well. And sometimes if the priest praising someone uh, becomes a kind of a bit of flattery, then uh, we have to uh, the praise them in a very uh, secret manner or at another part of time. If someone else uh, praise you and uh, tells a good quality about uh, other thing, then you have to think in this way that, of course, he might have seen the positive as positive. Then when someone praise you, if you end up uh, feeling proud for yourself or generating of generation, generating pride within yourself, this is wrong. Verse number 76, the third line, if my own good qualities are spoken about, I should just know and be aware that I have them. So whatever activities that we uh, do in our daily life, it has to be a step to enhance the practice of our bodhicitta. As Shantideva himself says that as once you have the bodhicitta practice, then from that onwards uh, we will move from happiness to happiness and elevate it to superior grounds. So verse number 77 reads that all deeds of others are the source of a joy. That will be rare even if it could be bought with money. Therefore, I should be happy in finding this joy in the good things that are done by others. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> So the best thing is to tie it on my nose. <laughs> oh yeah. That's all I got to this. Can you read your knuckles? So so some don't have a tonic. So so some use the way. So we can make ourselves happy by changing the way we think about ourselves. <laughs> by one's own uh, way of thinking. So therefore, you don't have to pay. Uh, you don't have to pay something uh, to be uh, happy. So if you go to a great department store in Osaka city and ask them to uh, give you a happy mind, so then there it is impossible. So therefore, uh, it all depends on how you uh, think, shape your mind. So in this way, you can be uh, happier. 
So verse number 77, all deeds of others are source of joy, that will be rare, even it could be bought with money. And the verse number 79, it's about when talking, I should speak from my heart and what is relevant, making the meaning clear and the speech pleasing. I should not speak out of desire or hatred, but in gentle tones and in moderation. So this is very uh, wonderful. So whenever you speak, you should not speak uh, so that it uh, generates some uh, afflicted emotions, but... Uh, if you speak, you have to speak in such a way that people will feel happy in a very uh, moderate and gentle tones. And uh, whenever you see any uh, kind of sentient being, so this is verse number 80, when beholding someone with my eyes, thinking I shall fully awaken through depending upon this being, I shall look at him with an open heart and love. So whether it's a high official that you're looking at or an old uh, uh, beggar or some uh, anyone else. So you all have to look at them in an equal way. So you just have to uh, meditate that these are all uh, the the objects of your meditation to generate compassion towards all of them. So without them, there is no way that you can develop the compassion within you. So therefore, they are very, very beneficial for you. Verse number 81, always being motivated by great aspiration or being motivated by the remedial forces. If I worked in the fields of excellence, benefit and misery, great virtues will come about. Or uh, if it is your parents uh, whom they benefit you or someone who brings a harm to you, so for those uh, special persons who have a special connection to you like your parents so if you being disrespect to this person then the negativities that you may gain will be enormous verse number 82 endowed with wisdom and joy so there is not much in the remaining verse sorry the verse number 82 endowed with wisdom and joy I should undertake all that I do I not depend upon anyone else in my actions that I undertake so such a kind of a practice for example what we eat is mainly for the for our own living so similarly, those positive uh, actions and the positive practice that we discussed uh, before is all about you, our own sake. So therefore, you can never uh, say that uh, due to the other person, I'm not able to do that. So since this is all a dementing upon one's own thing, this is all for one's own sake. So we have to be very strong, not relying on our not relying on other persons, so you have to do it yourself and practice all these uh, positive qualities. Verse number 83, the perfections such as generosity are progressively more exalted, but for a little I should not forsake a great, principally I should consider what will be of the most benefit for others. All the practice pertaining to the six perfections like generosity and so on, we have to start from uh, beginning in a very uh, simple manner, but we shouldn't be contented with merely by that practice. We have to work towards how to enhance it further, how to cultivate it further. So be it in the term of a businessman who do some business in a store, of course he won't be satisfied with a mere uh, sale or something, So, but he will work hard towards generating more profit and so on. Similarly, so the, the calmness and the peace of the mind is something which can be elevated to its ultimate state, so there is no limit for the calmness of your, one's mind for you in terms of its progress. So therefore, we have to work hard towards walking it. 
But then there is another important factor that we have to keep in mind. For example, so the long term and the short term, so the long term is more important. So for a benefit, for the long term, we should not be clinging to uh, immediate and also uh, about the, what is the uh, purpose. So depending upon the great purpose, we have to uh, we have to be very conscious about what is more purposeful and what is realistic. Press number eighty four. When this is this is well understood, I should always strive for the welfare of others. The first thing merciful ones have allowed to do some actions that were forbidden. So since Lord Buddha is someone who thinks about very long-term uh, benefit, therefore even in the Vinaya teachings uh, where he speaks about the individual liberations, Pratimoksha Sutra, the Pratimoksha precepts, and he uh, pr gives the commitment to the, the monks about how they have to abide by the seven uh, commitments pertaining to the body and speech. But for the bodhisattvas, for the bodhisattvas, since they have to work for the numberless of sentient beings, so even some of the prohibitions that he has ab abolished or for the bodhisattva, for the practitioners, but were allowed, given exempted, given allowance to the bodhisattvas. For example, in Vinaya, a monk is not allowed to touch uh, gold or any uh, precious gems, but for bodhisattva, out of some uh, special reasons, they are allowed and even they are recommend to use the gold and other precious gems for the benefit of other people. So this is one uh, kind of uh, the difference that we have seen that uh, Buddhist Lord Buddha is a very uh, great teacher who consider the long term uh, more important also depending upon different uh, disciples he have given different uh, commitment and the next verse speaks about the generosity that we have to uh, do uh, the giving alms to everyone uh, to the alms seeker sorry and when we speak about the giving, we should not uh, uh, do any causes that will disintegrate the precious human labor for a mere small purpose. The verse number 87. Someone who has the very high levels of the realization pertaining to compassions and the bodhicitta, and we can find in the supplement to Middle Way philosophy by Chandakriti about the bodhisattva's practice, where they give uh, uh, even their body and the physical, uh, the limbs to. Uh, to the seekers, so but uh, it has been very prohibited for them to uh, do the generosity giving of their f arms and the body, uh, unless we have they have attained a very high level of the the realization pertaining to the skillful means and the wisdom. And in Vinaya, we have uh, also even in Vinaya, we have such restrictions that we should not uh, give teachings to a certain level of people, uh, someone who is standing or someone who is sleeping, and so on. This is pertaining to verse number 88, that the Dharma should not be explained to those who lack respect. And the next is that uh, if you, when you go to some pastures or some greenlands for your picnic or something, you should not uh, throw away your garbages and destroy the cleanliness. So the 98 verse, three times by day and three times by night, I shall recite the Sutra of Three Heaps. So the Three Heaps Sutra here is the Confession Sutra that we recite usually. So by doing the recitation of the uh, Three Heaps Sutra, we have to do the repentance. 
For by relying upon the Buddha's and the awakening mind, my remaining downfalls will be purified. So verse number 101, whether directly or indirectly, I should not do anything that is not for the benefit of others. So I will move on. So till here we have completed the fifth chapter, Guarding Alertness. So next is the chapter on patience, chapter number six. Please turn to chapter number six. Whatever wholesome deeds, such as venerating the Buddhas in generosity, that have been amassed over a thousand years, will all be destroyed in one moment of anger. There is no evil like hatred and no fortitude like patience. So generally, when we speak about virtuous accumulations and uh, uh, the factors which which will destroy the afflicted emotion, sorry, the which will destroy the merit, the meritorious activities can be also uh, other factors such as the wrong view and uh, so on. But here, when we speak about the anger as an agent and uh, to destroy our uh, accumulations, we are actually speaking about uh, decreasing the decreasing the quality of those merits. For example, the, if one is going to suffer for a longer time, then he may have to suffer for a lesser time, and so on. So therefore, the uh, anger is the verse in destroying the the accumulations that we have amassed for thousands of years. So when we think about the negativities pertaining to the anger and the benefits of the patients, so therefore, since we like the benefits, of course, so we have to uh, practice patience against anger. And generally, we will like to work towards patience. If we think that these all afflicted emotions by generally have capacity to destroy our peace and calmness, and merely by having such a thought, then we will work hard to distance ourselves from the afflicted emotions. For example, if there is a certain person, uh, your neighbor, and who is not very good, and who always deceive you and tell lies, so merely by understanding or getting this information, not by fighting, you will try to distance yourself from that family. Similarly, even within our mind, so all the afflicted emotions, when we see that these are by nature afflicted and negative, so therefore we won't take it uh, wholeheartedly or we will try to distance ourselves from them. But what we usually do is just consider the afflicted emotions as just another emotions within us. So therefore, so we are not able to do those practice. So therefore, we have to think about the benefits of patience and negativities of anger. And what are the negativities pertaining to anger? So this is the following verse. Verse number three, when someone is under the influence of anger, there is no peace in mind. My mind will not experience peace if it foster painful thoughts of hatred. I shall find no joy and happiness, unable to sleep. I shall feel unsettled. Even if you are under the influence of anger, then you will even uh, feel a good sleep or even you may hit your own head. I think uh, in Lhasa, uh, the few uh, car, few motors, vehicles, uh, that were even during the third Dal Dalai Lama. And I have uh, invited one uh, driver. I have rented a driver from India who will help me drive. And he is a bald-headed one, and he's very short-tempered. And one day he was lying uh, below the, the vehicle and trying to fix something. And something, I think he hit his head with uh, something. And he was so angry that he was hitting his head again to the car. <laughs> he was so short-tempered. So the actually why he became unpeaceful uh, reason is that he hit his mind. But then when the anger comes, he uh, has to uh, hurt his head again and again, so which is very irrelevant practice.
So I have uh, such stories to tell. I shall find no joy or happiness, unable to sleep. I shall feel settled. And uh, with those angers, uh, we will not find any kind of uh, pacified mind, always a disturbed mind. So verse number four, a master who has hatred is in danger of being killed. Even by those who for their wealth and happiness depend on his kindness. So even uh, those persons whom you really care about, but under the influence of anger, you may end up arguing with them and fighting with them. So we have to assume that the, by nature the anger is something which will destroy our peace of our mind. So merely by such a thought, the intensity of the anger will be calmed down. But another special way to uh, stop the arising of the anger is generally that uh, the anger arises when we have unsettled mind. So unhappiness, mind. So at, even at the causal period, we have to be very cautious about not to have a disturbed mind. So the disturbed mind leads to anger. So when the anger has already arrived, so at that time, if you tell people that anger is not good, you should not feel anger, so they will say that that may be so, but it won't have much effect because the person is already under the influence of anger. So before the anger rose to its full flame at the initial uh, causal time, if we are able to stop the disturbed mind which give rise to the anger, then it will be very effective to stop the anger from rising further. And uh, one of the causes for arising anger is uh, if someone inflict harm towards to you or your relatives or someone your friends. And uh, second thing is uh, if someone harms uh, you or your friends from getting something that you want, this is actually related to the eight uh, worldly concerns. And if someone uh, creates some obstacle, obscuration towards attainment, towards your own uh, certain attainment of an object, and if someone blocks that, then the anger also rises. So this is verse number seven. Therefore, I shall, sorry, verse number eight. Therefore, I shall totally eradicate the fuel of this enemy. So therefore, we have to focus on the causes that give rise to anger. So if we stop the causes that give rise to anger, then the resultant, which is the anger, will not arrive. So when someone is already in a great uh, anger, then there will not be much things that we can do to stop it. For this enemy has no other function than that of causing me harm. And the objective of the anger is merely to harm you, and it, it do not have any other work than to harm you. If it is a conventional enemy, like your uh, neighbor or something, uh, whom you generally designate as enemy, so they may not be always engaging to harm you. So there are many other uh, time where they won't be your enemy or they will not be harming you, but the anger is different. So verse number 9 reads, Whatever befalls me, I shall not disturb my mental joy. For having been made unhappy, I shall not accomplish what I wish, and my virtues will decline. Why be unhappy about something if it can be remedied? And what is the use of being unhappy about something if it cannot be remedied? So if it is something that we can remedy, then there is no reason why we should be unhappy. So when some unfortunate incident happened, if it is something that we can mend or find a solution to it, then of course we, there is no need to 
uh, disturb your mind. So we have to find the solution for that. But if it's something there can there is no solution for that, then there is no uh, gain or anything upon being sorry about that. And the next verse speaks about the eight uh, worldly concern that if you uh, get some offerings for yourself, then you feel pleased. But if some same thing happened to your enemies, you don't feel uh, uh, happy. And if you have fame, you feel uh, happy. But if the same thing happens to your enemies, you do not feel happy. So similarly for uh, the praise and so on. So all these uh, mental states actually uh, give rise to a disturbed emotion. <coughs> Verse number 17, some when they see their own blood become especially brave and steady, but some when they see the blood of others faint and fall unconscious. Verse number 18, these reactions come from the mind being either steady or timid. Therefore, I should disregard harm's cause to me and not be affected by suffering. And someone, if uh, there is some certain uh, kind of person, so whenever they happen to have a, even a small incident, but they will uh, make a huge hay out of it. But there's also other people, even though they may undergo a huge uh, problem or something, but they won't be so much disturbed. So in terms of our physical uh, suffering, so by the way uh, we think about, we have a mental, uh, by the way we think about the suffering in our mind, so the intensity of the suffering will change. It was many years before uh, when I went for the pilgrimage to the Vulture Peak and uh, something I think uh, it was a poison or something that I had strong illness in my stomach and I went to Patna, the Indian city in Bihar in northern state and after arriving in Patna I had very severe uh, pain in my stomach. And in the afternoon, while I was traveling in the car from the Vulture Peak to the Patna, I saw many uh, poor children who have no shoes to wear and they were not going to any schools. Very uh, poor, uh, the, the children I saw on the road, and I thought about those uh, children. Then when I entered the outskirts of the Patna city, and there was uh, just a... Uh, uh, there was just a cult of an uh, old man uh, with wearing only a small white scarf, which is uh, also very, uh, very badly dirtied, and he was just lying on that cult, and he was very ill. Then I feel very uh, sad looking at that person, and there is he was very old, and there is no one to take care of him. He was something without any protection and protector. So merely about thinking these two, uh, the children and the, the old man, so the pain within myself in the stomach, I seem to have forgot about the pain. And I thought that this is something that I can bear. So if you think uh, very strongly about other person's uh, sufferings, so that your own physical suffering within you may recite a lot. So this is a possibility. So if you... Uh, practice in this way, this is something that we all can do, which shows that our mental emotions uh, pertaining to our mental state are much stronger compared to the physical emotions, emotions related to our physicals. So the sufferings pertaining to our physical can be uh, overcome with a very strong uh, mental state. So if, which, uh, in other words, if you have a very disturbed mind, then even if you have a very affluent facilities pertaining to your physical comfort and so on, but your whole body may not be in very peace. So therefore, we have to make effort to have uh, very calm and peaceful uh, mind. Hmm? 
So verse number 19, for when war is being waged against the deserving conceptions, much harm is caused at the time of battle. His Holiness comments that, so generally when we take the Bodhisattva vows and also uh, to the practice, of course, since we are used to the afflicted emotions and its actions for so many years and so many lives, so we may find our Bodhisattva uh, practices very difficult. So at that time, we have to be very patient and think that this is something relevant. So today, when we say the, the Islamic term jihad, so every, pe every people will have a holy war or something to create war or something. But I've seen some of the practitioners of the Islam, they say that the meaning of the term, the term jihad is to fight against your own disturbed mind. So this is the actual meaning of the term jihad. So all this text, the teachings coming out of this text, in that sense, is also jihad. The verse number 20, the victorious warriors are those who having disregarded all suffering. So someone if who can disregard and take antidote against the afflicted emotion is really the supreme warrior and the supreme trumpet. And uh, by the practice of the wisdom realizing emptiness, we will be, one will be able to destroy completely the true grasping. And uh, so with this, uh, with this practice, we will not be uh, feeling very boast or pride for oneself and also feeling compassionate for other. So from the 27 uh, verse onwards, it is about refutation of the non-Buddhist views, so we do not have to read uh, mainly about the super, supreme generality pertaining to the Samkhya school, or uh, after that there is another, the primary substance, then uh, the next a verse is about refuting the self as eternal as being accepted by the Mimamsa tradition. The verse number 31, hence everything is governed by other factors are governed by others, and in this way nothing governs itself. Having understood this, I should not become angry with phenomena that are like appretence. So there is still some time. And uh, uh, due to the anger, a lot of afflicted emotion can give rise. Of course, there may be the conditions, maybe even the external uh, physical things. So that is one thing, but the mainly the inner uh, emotions are even stronger and that may give rise to higher intensity of anger. So this is verse number 38. So once being under the influence of the afflicted emotions, even one will end up doing uh, harm against oneself and also to other people. So being under the influence of uh, such, uh, such afflicted emotions, then we have to feel very compassionate toward those persons who end up hurting themselves and the other under the influence of those emotions. So if this is the really the nature of all the ordinary persons to be under the influence of uh, the afflicted emotions, then there is nothing that we can change because it is the nature, the human nature. But if it is adventitious or something a temporary uh, that can be avoided, then we can avoid it. For example, if it is a gun, uh, or a stick that hurts you and brings pain to you, then we have to actually feel anger towards that weapon. 
And but of course, there is an agent, the person who has uh, pulled the trigger in terms of a gun. But then the person itself, uh, if you look further, then there is a consciousness within that person, and again, which is driven by the emotions, the disturbing emotions, the anger and the afflicted emotions. So it is actually things. So then there are three things. First, you have the weapon, then the person, and the afflicted emotions which motivated all these actions. So instead of uh, feeling anger to the first and the third, why you should get angry only to the person? So this is a very logical uh, reason, very good logic. And the next is about if someone uh, criticizes you or if someone praises you, and uh, then if uh, disturbing, if it disturbs your mind, then it says that merely if someone criticizes you, it really doesn't bring you any physical pain. Then why should you feel uh, anger towards it? So the reason why you feel pain if someone or you feel disturbed if someone criticizes you is because you have a too much of self-centered feelings. So uh, if merely by criticizing, uh, if someone criticizes you, there is no possibility that that person's criticism will disturb uh, your uh, peace of mind. And we have in the uh, training of the eight verses of the training of the mind that uh, this kind of the persons who normally criticize you has to be taken as a supreme object of giving rise to one's own the practice of compassion. And so we have to regard them as one's uh, teacher of our patients. Uh, so therefore, we should not be over excited when someone praises you, or we should not be too much disturbed when someone criticizes you. So the following verses speak about these topics. Eighty-seven, the verse number eighty-seven. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. Even if your enemy is meant unhappy, what is there for you to be joyful about? You are merely wishing to not cause him to be injured. And even if he does not, if he, even if he does suffer as you have wished, what is there for you to be joyful about? So if. Uh, so, if your friends or your enemy encounter uh, some harm, so why? What is the reason there to be uh, joyful? So, even by your feeling joyful towards such an action, it will only result in your own uh, suffering later on. So the next verse is about the praising uh, towards if someone prays you, and there is nothing unhappy to be if someone uh, criticizes you. And uh, please turn to verse number 104. Verse number 104, if without it something does not occur, and if with it it does come to be, then since this would be the cause of patience, how can I say that he prevents it? So if there is uh, this uh, phenomena, then uh, the another phenomena comes into rise. So therefore, this is called the cause. So in order to have the patience, the practice of patience, so one needs to have the enemy. So without enemy, there is no object of patience. So to foster one's own the practice of patience, so it is very necessary to have uh, an enemy out there. And the verse number 107, 
Therefore, just like Trisha appearing in my house without any effort on it, on my behalf to obtain it, I should be happy to have an enemy, for he assists me in my contact of awakening. So therefore, uh, your enemy came into being, uh, and uh, whereby you are able to practice patience. So therefore, you have to be happy about it, and you have to uh, re repay his kindness and remember his kindness. And because I am able to practice patience with him, he is worthy of being given. And uh, when you practice patience, of course, you get you accumulate a huge, uh, uh, huge amount of merit, and your patience arises due to the help of your enemy. So both becomes very important. And the verse number hundred and nine says that. So if that is the case, then your friend do not have the intention to help you. So then why should you uh, feel uh, patience? Why should you feel good for the, your friends? If that is the case, then even the truth of cessation or the wisdom realizing emptiness do not have an intention to, to benefit you. So even though they do not have the intention to benefit you, but being by just by practicing uh, and uh, generating those uh, positive minds, you, ben you ultimately you are benefited by it. So similarly, by the presence of your enemy, you are benefited in the practice of compassion. Uh, sorry, practice of patience. In the verse number hundred and ten. But surely my enemy is not to be venerated, for he intends to cause me harm. Of course, my enemy has the intention to harm me. So if you say that the Dharma teachings, even though they do not may have the intention to help me, but neither they do not have the intention to harm me, but my friend, my enemy, uh, but my enemy even has the intention to harm me. So then the reply to this is that it is similar to what the, the doctors did as in terms of helping you and cure your illness. The doctors and the medical practitioners cut your body and do a lot of uh, things which brings pain to you. So this is verse number 111. Thus, since patient acceptance is produced, independence upon is a very hateful mind. So they become enemy because they have, the, uh, due to their uh, afflicted emotions, such as the wish to harm other people and those motivations, they are designated as enemy. And by the presence of those uh, enemy, you are able to practice patience. So therefore, you have to regard them as your master. So verse number 112. Therefore, the mighty one has said that the field of sentient being is a Buddha field. For how many who have pleased them have thereby reached perfection? A Buddha's qualities are gained from the sentient beings and the conquerors alike. So why do I not respect them in the same way as I respect the conquerors? So with the other sentient beings as our focus, we practice the compassion and bodhicitta. And also for the Buddha, we go for refuge and do veneration and paying homage to uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, by the help, by which help we will be able to generate, uh, gain the spiritual, uh, spiritual uh, realizations and so on. Therefore, your realization of the enlightenment is actually uh, being combinedly uh, make it possible by the help of the Buddha on the one side and also the sentient being on the other side. So therefore, they too play the same role in your ability to reach the enlightenment. So therefore, if that is the case, then why should you venerate the Buddha and why should you not pay importance to the sentient being? There is no reason for that. That 
Verse number 115. Whatever venerating one with a loving mind is due to the eminence of sentient beings. And in the same way, the merit of having faith in Buddha is due to the eminence of Buddha. And uh, after that, there is one uh, good verse. 119, verse number 119. And uh, we consider the Buddhas and also the high level of Bodhisattvas as our object of refuge. And but those uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas consider the sentient beings more important. And uh, we go for refuge to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas on the one side, but on the other hand, those sentient beings whom the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have high regard, if we do not have any respect for those sentient beings, then this is a big contradictory in our practice. So therefore, we have to also have a high regard and a respect for all the sentient beings. So this is very reasonable. And being going refuge to the Buddha and one of the most one of the greatest way to please the Buddha is by uh, having respect and doing a benefit for the sentient beings. And even if they cause some harm to you and inflict harm to you, you do not return it in the same way. So this is the supreme practice and the supreme uh, offering to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Verse number 125. From now on, in order to delight the Tathagatas, I shall serve the universe and definitely cease to cause harm. Although many beings may kick and stamp upon the field, even at the risk of dying, may I delight the protectors of the world. <coughs> Sorry. So even the sentient beings may cause uh, a lot of harm to you in some way, but uh, in whatever way, uh, you have to feel very compassionate towards them. And so in, by this practice of mine, may the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas be really pleased. So we are about to finish this chapter. So if we are able to benefit the other people in this way, so this is coming from verse number 126. There is no doubt that those with the nature of compassion regard all this being as themselves. Furthermore, for those who see as the nature of sentient beings, see the Buddhas themselves. Why then do I not respect beings? And the verse number 27. So the main practice of the patients is being respectful towards the sentient beings. And uh, it's also the source for uh, uh, source for gaining the immediate uh, human rebirths and the higher rebirths, and also the permanent uh, the liberation and the enlightenment will also arise by practice the patience. So this verse is very wonderful. So then remaining verses uh, explains that even for common people, uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, harm any uh, common people because they have the king or someone protecting them. Similarly, we cannot harm or disregard any sentient beings because they are protected by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So here completes the chapter on patience. We will stop here for today. So, thank you.